Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord. It's something that, of course, we know that we should do, and we throw that word around, or at least we throw the word joy around and rejoice a lot. And, of course, we know that because Christ has offered salvation unto all men, to those that would obey, that those that have can rejoice. And we understand that. Uh, But I really want to try to dig a little deeper, if you will, in our minds to really mull that idea over in our head about uh, rejoicing in the Lord. It's something that I think we, we live in a time and we live in a place where the idea of joy is left to a very superficial definition. When we think about what makes you joyful and what makes you happy, you know, and we, I think we confuse the word, the idea of happy with joy. And, and, and while they can work together, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with saying they're exactly the same thing. But, and I know that many people operate on that, on that assumption that being joyful and rejoicing in the Lord means that everything is roses and perfect and uh, every day is is happy because of the and even the circumstances surrounding them but if we stop and think we understand that the circumstances of our life sometimes are not happy sometimes we're ill as mentioned there are several today that are home dealing with the ailments of 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 this physical life and uh that sometimes can make it an unhappy day when it comes to that how we feel superficially but if we look at habakkuk uh, chapter 3 at verse 18 we we see a statement that uh kind of helps start to put things into perspective in habakkuk 3 18 it says i yet i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation It's the salvation that is our focus and our goal. And that's where our true joy can come from. That's where we can have the joy that is, that that can't be touched by the problems of this life. The joy and the comfort, the, the, uh, just being okay with the situation that you're in, even though it might not, it might be painful physically even though it might be taxing to the mind because you have many things happening in your life and so what I'm really trying to drill down to and have us leave this assembly with is the idea that we should be joyful and we should rejoice in the Lord and we should rejoice because of that salvation that we have or at the very least is offered to us. If you're sitting here today and you have not put on Christ in baptism, I offer, of course, that that you think about those things and that you that you make the proper adjustments in your life. That you allow yourself to think about the Lord and how much joy you can have by knowing that you are in that saved condition. This is something that is only accessible in the Lord. We are to rejoice in the Lord, but that, that's a statement that isn't, that isn't apply, can't be properly applied to all people. Yes, you should. All people should rejoice in the Lord, but you can't rejoice in the Lord unless you have been obedient to his will. There's a, there's a separation there. Yes, of course, the Lord is the Lord. And you can be happy about that. But to truly have that joy in the Lord means, just as Habakkuk says, joying in the God of my salvation. That is the important part of that, of that thought, of that, of that passage. As we continue to think about this, let's look at Matthew chapter 25. 
Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 21. It begins at verse 21. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, you can read the context of that a little bit further. I didn't want to go into a a, a long reading there to make this point. But this little section uh, makes my the, the point that I want to bring across here. You know, the, when you think about what is being said there, and when you think about the, you know, the parable of the talents, and, and this person, these people were entrusted with certain things, and we know that, that these two had some gain, and we know that there was another guy that didn't have any gain, and it turned out differently for him. But that's, that's, for, another, that's for another lesson. But notice that when, when, when the person is told by their, by, their, by their Lord, enter into the joy of your Lord. Notice that it's the Lord's joy. It's not that person's. And when we have joy in the Lord, it's a joy that, is, that, that comes from the Lord. It's not a joy that, that comes from us. It's not something that we have done, and it's not something that we... that uh, it's it's not the same thing as us being happy. It's not the same thing as us being joyful in a superficial way as we often are in this world. You know, many things can bring short-term joy. I can have, you know what, I like those, uh, the Reese's, uh, the the, the candy bars that have the, the pretzels and the caramel and the chocolate all together, whatever, the take five, I think that's what those are called. Those are really good. And, and, and that just hits the, hits the spot on my taste buds. And that brings me some happiness for a moment, for a fleeting moment. And you might even, you know, throw in there the word joy, but it's a superficial joy. You know, even there's that, that candy bar that has the word joy in its name to indicate that it's going to make you joyful if you eat it. But that's a superficial and a passing joy. It's really more akin to, to happiness. You know, many, many of those things that we can think of bring us that short-term joy. And our emotions surrounding our conversion can bring us some joy. You've heard of people coming up out of the waters of baptism on fire for the Lord. And, you know, I've, I've heard people say to those that have been recently converted and recently baptized that, you know, I, I hope you, you hold on to that fire that you have for the Lord now. Because they're indicating and they know from experience that that emotional high, it dwindles away. It is something that something that goes away for a time. Now we can think about how fortunate we are and we can rekindle some of that emotion. But that's not the joy of the Lord. That that feeling in the pit of your stomach, that happiness that you you feel in the at that moment is not the joy of the Lord. It's it's great. It's wonderful. It feels good, but we know it's short-lived. Lasts longer for some than others, but it's not an eternal joy. The joy of the Lord is so much more. You know, if we learn to genuinely receive it and and genuinely uh, joy in the things of the Lord because of the Lord... Uh, you know, then we, then we start to get it. And I'm not even sure I can properly put it into words. Um, that's why I'm, I'm going to lean on, on someone who uh, wrote something that I think makes a little bit of sense here. This is uh, a Bible commentary by E.M. Zur. I found myself using it a little bit in my studies. And I find that it says things in a way that I wish I could sometimes. So as we uh, look at this at verse 21 and 21 through 20, 
uh, 3. Uh, and I'm just going to skip around here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in speaking of joy in verse 21, it's the joy provided by the Lord to be shared together in heaven. And that's the idea I want to come, come across with is this is the joy that is provided by the Lord. It is not something that, that we create. It's not something that you know, we can be so faithful and so good and, and do so well at checking the, the boxes in our list of things a Christian should do that we can get this joy. It's something that the Lord gives us if we'll receive it. And we can receive it when we truly come to understand his will for us in the scriptures. In verse 23, uh, it is mentioned that these uh, two men received the same sentence from their Lord. And that's, that's something else, that's another, another whole thought there, is that these two men, while they did things a little bit differently, realizing that they were still given the same sentence, the same reward. That, that is something that should bring us comfort. That is something that should lend to that joy because we understand that we don't have to be perfect. If we are trying to create the joy for ourselves, if we're trying to um, have that check box of, okay, I'm a Christian, I know I need to do this, I need to be nice to people, I need to, I need to uh, lay by in store, I need to show up on Sunday morning, I need to go through these different things, and we expect that that's going to bring us joy by us being perfect, then we've kind of missed the point. The Lord isn't requiring us to be perfect because we can't, and he knows that. All he wants is for us to do our best and be faithful you know each of these servants was faithful and they were faithful to the extent that they had the op they, they took advantage of the opportunity faithful to the extent of his power and opportunity and he will receive the the one and only reward in store which is the entrance into the joy of the lord the idea of being faithful to the extent that you are able to be being faithful and obedient and doing the things that you can with everything in your, in your power. And, and by saying to the extent that you are able, I'm not saying that we should write ourselves a pass to do, to do less. I'm not saying that we need to, that we need to say, well, I just, just take a pass and say, well, I, I'm just not good at that. So I'm going to, I'm just not going to do that. I'm just going to be lazy about my, my faith. I'm not saying that at all. We should put it all into it. We should do everything in our power to be faithful, but realizing that by doing everything in our power, we aren't creating the joy. The Lord gives us that joy because of that understanding of that hope that we have in him. You know, Christian's joy, just to, just to say a few things more about it, it's just not rooted in in external things you know the things of this world as i mentioned before they can give us that fleeting feeling of, of of happiness they may give us something that we equate to joy but it's just not the joy of the lord it is not rooted in the external things of this life it's not rooted in the things that you can do you know our joy in the lord it really has nothing to do with us Originally, when I put this point on here, I, I, I said that the joy in the Lord had little to do with us. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it some more, and then I went back and changed it to nothing. Because I just don't think that it has anything to do with us. Of course, we, we have to take the step in faith. We have to put forth the effort to come to the knowledge of truth, and we have to put forth that effort to take that step in, in obedience to Christ. But that joy, again, it's not bound up in that decision. And it's not bound up in how good we are. It's bound up in how good Christ is. It's the joy of the Lord that is offered to us. And it's, it's free. We just have to receive it. And we have to put ourselves into the, into the mindset of I'm excited and happy about this hope that I have in heaven. And yes, things might go south in my life today. 
or tomorrow or the next day or at some point, life might turn sour on me. I might not have an easy time. You think of all of those that, you know, have gone through horrible tragedy in their lives. Think those that, you know, may, may be uh, called into a war situation and, and, and will not live a, a life as long as some of us. Those that, those that have been born with uh, physical difficulties and ailments that will plague them for all of their days and maybe make their days short. They have every reason to be joyful as well if they are in Christ because it doesn't matter what happens to this physical body. It matters what we have our hope in. In 1 Thessalonians 1 at verse 6, it says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Understanding a bit of the Godhead, understanding that that's kind of uh, barking up the same the same alley there the idea of the joy of the Holy Spirit you know that that's all connected with the joy of the Lord the joy of God if you will and in first Thessalonians 2 of verse 19 a few pages later for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ it is coming and, and remembering that this is a letter written to the church at Thessalonica. And uh, he's telling that church that the joy is that you're going to be there in the end with Christ. You're going to be there and you're going to be accepted by Christ. Is that, that's where our joy should come from. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It's not in the stuff of this world. It's not in any aspect of this physical life it's in what we have to look forward to and when when we really truly come to that that place where we're grounded in that physical life will become a whole lot easier now I, i'm not standing here telling you that i've that i've perfected that i'm still working on that just like you are uh but i but i do know as i've progressed and, and trying to really understand the joy of the Lord and understanding that it doesn't mean that I have to be perfect and it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that I have to create the happiness or that joyful feeling. It takes that load off of your shoulders and it becomes so much easier to walk that path, whatever your path is in life, whatever whatever lies in store for you. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, a little further yet. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything we should give thanks. And, and, and that means look around and everything that you see. All of the things in your life, give thanks for them. And realizing that the, the, the Lord desires for us to be thankful for those things because we have that joy that hope and even though the things we see around us might be tarnishing and rotting away even though the things that that we have might not be the newest and the shiniest even though they might not live up to our human expectations we should be thankful for them even if uh, uh, they aren't so pretty in the eyes of the world you know I, i've mentioned before uh i think it applies to this situation here too uh that i took my grandmother uh, before she passed away to visit with my grandfather's last surviving brother in west virginia and i told you i, I believe that we went into this house and this house had a dirt floor and i and i was looking around me like kind of like this is a shack like what why do they live this way? And I, 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 I felt kind of bad for them. And then I stepped back for a moment and then driving away, I realized, you know, those are the happiest people I've ever met. But they don't have anything. They didn't have anything as far as physical things. But they were truly happy, comfortable, and satisfied with where they were. And as Christians, that's what we need to do too. We need to be happy and satisfied and comfortable with where we are because we're in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, I, I, I have every 
intention of pricking your heart today to want to be there so that you can take a hold of this joy as well. You know, our path won't always be easy, and our hope and joy is not on this earth, as we've been, been pointing out. And 1 Thessalonians 2.19, kind of, I think it really drives that home. Uh, and we should give thanks in all things, because our hope still stands even when we physically can't. You know, when all things are crashing down around us, that hope is still there for the one that is in Christ. And it has absolutely nothing to do with them. It has absolutely nothing to do with the state of their life at that point in time. It has everything to do with Christ. This joy that I'm speaking of is inexpressible. It's kind of uh, almost silly for me to try to get up here and expect that I can, that I can tell you about it properly. <laughs> Because it's, well, inexpressible. And First Peter 1 at verse 8, it tells us that. In First Peter 1 at verse 8, it says, Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, and that's the substance of faith. It's that believing in the things that you can't see and understanding that he is. As we... As we talked about this morning in the Bible study, as is mentioned, that we don't have a blind faith. We don't have a faith that we can't look around us and see the evidence of God. But when the things that we do see, having not seen him in person, any of us, yet we still believe and we have that joy that we just can't even express. There just are no words to express the joy that is founded in Christ, it so far surpasses any joy that we could come up with or that we could cook up in any kind of human way. You know, if we look at 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 through 9, let, let's turn there and just kind of look, look at that for just a moment. First Peter chapter 1, and uh, what, what I'm really uh, lo looking for there is that statement in First Peter 1, 8. That was the main focus there, but I think it helps us to just kind of read, uh, re read the context there. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, Yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Kind of says it all right there that, you know, as we have that joy inexpressible, you know, we're going to go through troubles. In Christ we are kept in verse 5. We have that reservation, if you will. You know, it's... If you've, been, if you've ever traveled, you know, traveling with my parents years ago, my, my parents were, and maybe it, w it was different back then uh, to a degree, but my parents would just jump in the car and drive in the direction they wanted to go, and when they got tired, they'd just find the first hotel and stop at it. I can't live that way. You know, I have to know where I'm going to go 
and I have to make the reservation ahead of time so that I know I'm getting the better deal and I, I, and I make the plan as we go from place to place. I, I can't live with the idea that there might not be a room available when I get to where I want to go. I, I can sleep in the car, but I don't want to. But we have, I'm comforted by the idea that I have a reservation. So much more I'm comforted by the, the, the knowledge of the truth that I have that reservation in heaven. That, that there's, a, there's a place waiting for me. And that's, again, joy inexpressible. To know that you have that place. To know that even though... You know, as a Christian, you, you probably have the feeling from time to time that you just don't fit in in this world. I've said it before that if you don't have that feeling, you might want to think about it because you're probably doing it wrong. We're supposed to be different. It's supposed to be a little bit trying to deal with the things of this world. This joy is inexpressible and it is the fruit of faith and eternal hope. You know, it, it kind of is because of that hope that we have. But because of that hope, we can truly have that joy. And that's where it kind of trickles down into our life. And it makes, makes it kind of look like happiness. To a person who knows that they have that reservation ahead, that knows that they have nothing to worry about no matter what happens to this, this body, no matter what happens to us in this life, that joy is something that is going to bring forth what looks like happiness on this earth. But they're not to be confused, as we've already kind of made that point. In Romans 15, at verse 13, we read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And again, when we understand the Holy Spirit and his working here on this earth one of the most important major things that he's done for us is that he's given us the god-breathed word and in that we can abound in hope we can look into what effectively is the power of the holy spirit and we can understand that hope that we have and we can have that joy as we close things out we really want to be thinking about the idea that this is a truly joyful christian trusts in the lord without wavering and that that's something that we you know we read about you know not wavering in in james as well but uh we we can't be those that allow ourselves to be dragged down by the things that happen to us physically to where it affects us, to where we don't take advantage of the joy of the Lord. So are you jo greatly rejoicing in the Lord today? Isaiah 61 at verse 10 speaks to that. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And that is where our joy is. And so again, if you're sitting here today and you have not put on Christ in baptism, realize that you can't take advantage of that joy of the Lord until you have put forth the effort to come to know him, to be obedient to him, not because... Well, because he said so, but also because you desire to be with him. You desire to do what he wills because you know who he is and because you are giving him the authority he is due. And in that, once that is completed, you can have that joy in the Lord. That joy that perhaps you don't understand yet. None of us truly understand it. But we will. But what we should know for now is that we should have joy in the Lord. And it, again, is not something we create. We often put ourselves into a corner when we try to make the joy that we should have. We're told to be joyful as Christians. But when we try to make it as a, that joy to be a result of something that we've done, 
you know, we, we cut ourselves off at the knees. That joy is in the Lord. And, be, and it is solely because of him and his action in our lives. Psalm 89 at verse 14 beginning says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. And in your righteousness they are exalted. Are you walking in the light today? Again, we offer the invitation of Christ. 1 John 1, 7 says, if, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Therein lies that root of great inexpressible joy that is from the Lord. So today, if you would like to walk in the light, realize that if you believe that he is, you know, having heard the word of God, you believe that he is, faith is growing in you, that you understand that Christ is. You're willing to confess him before men, not ashamed of him. And you're willing to repent of your sins, turning away from the things that God has said are sinful. And as we continue our walk, repentance is that process that continues. As we continue through our, through our lives, we're, we're in effect of the understanding that we are going to make our focus the Lord. Even though we might become distracted here and there, our focus is going to be the Lord. And we're going to strive to walk after him the rest of our days. If you're willing to do that, then why not submit to baptism as he is commanded of all mankind? Why not be buried in the waters of baptism so you can be raised to walk in that newness of life so that you can truly have that regeneration, that washing that comes from the blood of Christ. If you're subject to the invitation, please don't hesitate. Please come forward as we stand and sing.